Autoethnography is a form of qualitative research in which an author uses self-reflection and writing to explore anecdotal and personal experience and connect this autobiographical story to wider cultural, political, and social meanings and understandings. Autoethnography is a self-reflective form of writing used across various disciplines such as communication studies, performance studies, education, English literature, anthropology, social work, sociology, history, psychology, religious studies, marketing, business and educational administration, arts education, and physiotherapy. According to Marachal 2010, Autoethnography is a form or method of research that involves self-observation and reflexive investigation in the context of ethnographic field work and writing." p. 43. A well-known autoethnographer, Carolyn Ellis 2004, defines it as, "...research, writing, story, and method that connect the autobiographical and personal to the cultural, social, and political." p. xix. However, it is not easy to reach a consensus on the term's definition. For instance, in the 1970s, autoethnography was more narrowly defined as insider ethnography, referring to studies of the culture of a group of which the researcher is a member. Hayano, 1979. Nowadays, however, as Ellingson and Ellis 2008 point out, the meanings and applications of autoethnography have evolved in a manner that makes precise definition difficult. P. 449. According to Adams, Jones, and Ellis in Autoethnography, Understanding Qualitative Research, "...autoethnography is a research method that, uses a researcher's personal experience to describe and critique cultural beliefs, practices, and experiences. Acknowledges and values a researcher's relationships with others. Shows people in the process of figuring out what to do, how to live, and the meaning of their struggles." Adams, 2015. Social life is messy, uncertain, and emotional. If our desire to research social life, then we must embrace a research method that, to the best of its, our ability, acknowledges and accommodates mess and chaos, uncertainty and emotion." Adams, 2015. History 1970s, the term autoethnography was used to describe studies in which cultural members provide insight about their own cultures. Walter Goldschmidt proposed that all autoethnography is focused around the self and reveals personal investments, interpretations, and analyses. David M. Hayano was an associate professor of anthropology at California State University in Northridge. As an anthropologist, Hayano was interested in the role that an individual's own identity had in their research. Unlike more traditional research methods, Hayano believed there was value in a researcher conducting and writing ethnographies of their own people. 1980s, scholars became interested in the importance of culture and storytelling as they gradually became more engaged through the personal aspects in ethnographic practices. At the end of the 1980s, the scholars applied the term autoethnography to work that explored the interplay of introspective, personally engaged selves and cultural beliefs, practices, systems, and experiences. 1990s, emphasis began to be heavily placed on personal narratives and expansion of autoethnography use. Series such as Ethnographic Alternatives and the First Handbook of Qualitative Research were published to better explain the importance of autoethnographic use. Topic epistemological and theoretical basis Autoethnography differs from ethnography, a social research method employed by anthropologists and sociologists, in that autoethnography embraces and foregrounds the researcher's subjectivity rather than attempting to limit it, as in empirical research. While ethnography tends to be understood as a qualitative method in the social sciences that describes human social phenomena based on fieldwork, autoethnographers are themselves the primary participant, subject of the research in the process of writing personal stories and narratives. Autoethnography, as a form of ethnography, Ellis 2004 writes, is part auto or self and part ethno or culture p. 31 and something different from both of them, greater than its parts p. 32. In other words, as Ellingson and Ellis 2008 put it, whether we call a work an autoethnography or an ethnography depends as much on the claims made by authors as anything else p. 449. 
In embracing personal thoughts, feelings, stories, and observations as a way of understanding the social context they're studying, autoethnographers are also shedding light on their total interaction with that setting by making their every emotion and thought visible to the reader. This is much the opposite of theory-driven, hypothesis-testing research methods that are based on the positivist epistemology. In this sense, Ellingson and Ellis 2008 see autoethnography as a social constructionist project that rejects the deep-rooted binary oppositions between the researcher and the researched, objectivity and subjectivity, process and product, self and others, art and science, and the personal and the political pp. 450-459. Dr. Ian McCormick has outlined many of the benefits of combining visual technologies such as film with participant-led community development. Autoethnographers, therefore, tend to reject the concept of social research as an objective and neutral knowledge produced by scientific methods, which can be characterized and achieved by detachment of the researcher from the researched. Autoethnography, in this regard, is a critical response to the alienating effects on both researchers and audiences of impersonal, passionless, abstract claims of truth generated by such research practices and clothed in exclusionary scientific discourse Ellingson and Ellis, 2008, p. 450. Anthropologist Deborah Reed Danahay 1997 also argues that autoethnography is a postmodernist construct. The concept of autoethnography synthesizes both a postmodern ethnography, in which the realist conventions and objective observer position of standard ethnography have been called into question, and a postmodern autobiography, in which the notion of the coherent, individual self has been similarly called into question. The term has a double sense, referring either to the ethnography of one's own group or to autobiographical writing that has ethnographic interest. Thus, either a self-ethnography or an autobiographical auto ethnography can be signaled by autoethnography, p. 2 topic types, areas, and approaches of autoethnography Since autoethnography is a broad and ambiguous category that encompasses a wide array of practices Ellingson and Ellis, 2008, pp. 449-450, autoethnographies vary in their emphasis on the writing and research process graphy, culture, ethnos, and self auto, read Danahe, 1997, p. 2. According to Ellingson and Ellis, 2008, autoethnographers recently began to make distinction between two types of autoethnography, one is analytic autoethnography and the other is evocative autoethnography. Analytic autoethnographers focus on developing theoretical explanations of broader social phenomena, whereas evocative autoethnographers focus on narrative presentations that open up conversations and evoke emotional responses. P. 445 A special issue of the Journal of Contemporary Ethnography Volume 35 Issue 4, August 2006 contains several articles on the diverse definitions and uses of autoethnography. An autoethnography can be analytical see Leon Anderson, written in the style of a novel see Carolyn Ellis's methodological novel The Ethnographic Eye, performative see the work of Norman K. Denzen, and the anthology The Ends of Performance and many things in between. Symbolic interactionists are particularly interested in this method, and examples of autoethnography can be found in a number of scholarly journals, such as Qualitative Inquiry, the Journal of the Society for the Study of Symbolic Interactionism, the Journal of Contemporary Ethnography, and the Journal of Humanistic Ethnography. It is not considered mainstream as a method by most positivist or traditional ethnographers, yet this approach to qualitative inquiry is rapidly increasing in popularity, as can be seen by the large number of scholarly papers on autoethnography presented at annual conferences such as the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry, and the Advances in Qualitative Methods Conference sponsored by the International Institute of Qualitative Methodology. The spread of autoethnography into other fields is also growing e.g., psychology, and a recent special issue of the journal Culture and Organization Volume 13 Issue 3, Summer 2007 explores the idea of organizational autoethnography. Autoethnography in performance studies acknowledges the researcher and the audience having equal weight. Portraying the performed self through writing then becomes an aim to create an embodied experience for the writer and the reader. This area acknowledges the inward and outward experience of ethnography in experiencing the subjectivity of the author. Audience members may experience the work of ethnography through reading, hearing, feeling inward and then have a reaction to it outward, maybe by emotion. Ethnography and performance work together to invoke emotion in the reader. 
Higher education is also featuring more as the contextual backdrop for autoethnography probably due to the convenience of researching one's own organization see Sambrick, Stewart, and Roberts, 2008, Deloriert and Sambrick, 2009, 2011. Such contributions explore the autoethnographer as a researcher, teacher, administrator doing scholarly work and or as an employee working in higher education. Recent contributions include Humphreys 2005 Exploration of Career Change, Peleus 2003 Performance Narrative Telling of the Competing Pressures Faced by an Early Career Academic and Sparks 2007 Heartfelt Story of an Academic Manager During the Stressful Research Assessment Exercise 2008. There are several contributions that are insightful for the student autoethnographer including Sambrick, et al., 2008 who explore power and emotion in the student-supervisor relationship, Deloriert and Sambrick, 2009 who explore the ethics of the student autoreveal, Rambo, 2007 and her experiences with review boards, and finally Deloriert and Sambrick, 2011 discussion on managing creativity and innovation within a PhD thesis. Researchers have begun to explore the intersection of diversity, transformative learning, and autoethnography. Glowacki Dudka, Treff, and Usman 2005 first proposed autoethnography as a tool to encourage diverse learners to share diverse worldviews in the classroom and other settings. Both transformative learning and autoethnography are steeped in an epistemological worldview that reality is ever-changing and largely based on individual reflexivity. Drick Boyd 2008 examines the impact of white privilege on a diverse group of individuals. Through the autoethnographical process and transformative learning he comes to appreciate the impact of whiteness on his own actions and those of others. Similarly, Brent Sykes 2014 employs autoethnography to make meaning of his identity as both Native American and Caucasian. In his implications, he challenges higher education institutions and educators to provide spaces for learners to engage in autoethnography as a tool to promote transformative learning. Another recent extension of autoethnographic method involves the use of collaborative approaches to writing, sharing, and analyzing personal stories of experience. This approach is also labeled collaborative autobiography Alan Collinson and Hockey, 2001, Lapidat, 2009, and has been used in teaching qualitative research methods to university students. Autoethnography is also used in film as a variant of the standard documentary film. It differs from the traditional documentary film, in that its subject is the filmmaker himself or herself. An autoethnography typically relates the life experiences and thoughts, views and beliefs of the filmmaker, and as such it is often considered to be rife with bias and image manipulation. Unlike other documentaries, autoethnographies do not usually make a claim of objectivity. An important text on autoethnography in filmmaking is Catherine Russell's Experimental Ethnography, The Work of Film in the Age of Video Duke Up, 1999. For autoethnographic artists, see also Jesse Cornplanter, Kimberly Dark, Peter Pitsiolik, Ernest Spybeck. Autoethnography is being used in multiple subdisciplines in communication and media studies. For example, Bob Krizek took an autoethnographic approach to sports communication during the closing of Comiskey Park. Tony Adams utilized autoethnography to examine gay identity and the metaphor of coming out of the closet. Andrew F. Herman examined a period of unemployment during the financial crisis through an autoethnographic approach. Autoethnographic approaches are also being used in family and interpersonal communication research. Autoethnography is being used to examine popular culture artifacts and our relationships with pop culture. As Herman 2013 wrote, our identities and identifications with popular culture artifacts assist in our creation of self. Our identities and pop culture have a long-term recursive relationship. P. 7. Jimmy Manning and Tony Adams 2015 noted five strengths for autoethnographic approaches to popular culture, including 1. Use personal experience to write alongside popular culture theories and texts, especially to show how personal experiences resemble or are informed by popular culture. 2. Use personal experience to criticize, write against, and talk back to popular culture texts, especially texts that do not match their personal experiences or that espouse harmful messages. 3. Describe how they personally act as as audience members, specifically how they use, engage, and relate to popular texts, events, and or celebrities. 4. Describe the processes that contribute to the production of popular culture texts, and 5. Create accessible research texts that can be understood by a variety of audiences. p. 199-200. 
Autoethnographer Robin Boylorn examined televised media and the representations of race. Jimmy Manning used autoethnography to examine polymediated narrative and relationships in reference to catfishing. Similarly, autoethnography is becoming more widely accepted as a method by which to study organizations. According to Perry and Boyle, organizational autoethnography illuminates the relationship between the individual and the organization, especially culture as it is practiced and understood within institutional and organizational settings. As Marie Boyle and Ken Perry noted, organizational autoethnographies can provide first-hand accounts of taboo topics such as sexual harassment and bullying, motherhood at work, various moral dilemmas and highly charged emotional situations in the workplace p. 189. In one early organizational autoethnography, Kathy Miller 2002 presented a how one professor continued to be a professor after a bonfire incident at Texas A&M, which killed 12 people. In her 2015 article, Shauna Redden 2015 explores the impacts of moving from a storyteller to a story told about position in a near-fatal airplane accident. Examining a non-profit arts center, Herman 2011 examined co-optation and ristance of various economic discourses by organizational volunteers. In her layered account, Vickers 2007 explored her experiences of workplace bullying. Herman, Barnhill, and Poole 2013 wrote a co-authored autoethnography of their experiences and impressions at an academic conference. Topic storyteller, narrator in different academic disciplines particularly communication studies and performance studies, the term autoethnography itself is contested and is sometimes used interchangeably with or referred to as personal narrative or autobiography. Autoethnographic methods include journaling, looking at archival records, whether institutional or personal, interviewing one's own self, and using writing to generate a self-cultural understandings. Reporting an autoethnography might take the form of a traditional journal article or scholarly book, performed on the stage, or be seen in the popular press. Autoethnography can include direct and participant observation of daily behavior, unearthing of local beliefs and perception and recording of life history e.g. kinship, education, etc., and in-depth interviewing. The analysis of data involves interpretation on the part of the researcher Hammersley and Genzuck. However, rather than a portrait of the other person, group, culture, the difference is that the researcher is constructing a portrait of the self. Autoethnography can also be associated with narrative inquiry and autobiography Maréchal, 2010, p. 43 in that it foregrounds experience and story as a meaning-making enterprise. Maréchal argues that narrative inquiry can provoke identification, feelings, emotions, and dialogue p. 45. Furthermore, the increased focus on incorporating autoethnography and narrative inquiry into qualitative research indicates a growing concern for how the style of academic writing informs the types of claims made. As Laurel Richardson articulates, I consider writing as a method of inquiry, a way of finding out about a topic. Form and content are inseparable. 2000, p. 923. For many researchers, experimenting with alternative forms of writing and reporting, including autoethnography, personal narrative, performative writing, layered accounts and writing stories, provides a way to create multiple layered accounts of a research study, creating not only the opportunity to create new and provocative claims but also the ability to do so in a compelling manner. Ellis 2004 says that autoethnographers advocate the conventions of literary writing and expression, in that Autoethnographic forms feature concrete action, emotion, embodiment, self-consciousness, and introspection portrayed in dialogue, scenes, characterization, and plot. P. XIX. According to Bachner and Ellis 2006, an autoethnographer is, first and foremost a communicator and a storyteller. In other words, autoethnography, depicts people struggling to overcome adversity, and shows people in the process of figuring out what to do, how to live, and the meaning of their struggles." p. 111. Therefore, according to them, autoethnography is "...ethical practice," and "...gifts," that has a caregiving function. p. 111. In essence autoethnography is a story that reenacts an experience by which people find meaning and through that meaning are able to be okay with that experience. 
In Dewan's 2017 opinion this can be a problem because many readers may see us as being too self-indulgent but they have to realize that our stories and experiences we share are not solely ours, but rather that they also represent the group we are autoethnographically representing in this storytelling process. The researcher seeks to make meaning of a disorienting experience. A life example in which autoethnography could be applied is the death of a family member or someone close by. In this painful experience people often wonder how they will go about living without this person and what it will be like. In this scenario, especially in religious homes, one often asks, Why God? Thinking that with an answer as to why the person died they can go about living. Others, wanting to be able to offer up an explanation to make the person feel better, generally say things such as, at least they are in a better place. Or, God wanted him, her home. People, who are never really left with an explanation as to why, generally fall back on the reason that, it was their time to go. And through this somewhat, explanation, find themselves able to move on and keep living life. Over time when looking back at the experience of someone close to you dying, one may find that through this hardship they became a stronger more independent person, or that they grew closer to other family members. With these realizations, the person has actually made sense of and has become fine with the tragic experience that occurred. And through this autoethnography is performed. Topic. Evaluation The main critique of autoethnography, and qualitative research in general, comes from the traditional social science methods that emphasize the objectivity of social research. In this critique, qualitative researchers are often called journalists, or soft scientists, and their work, including autoethnography, is termed unscientific, or only exploratory, or entirely personal and full of bias. Many quantitative researchers regard the materials produced by narrative as the means by which a narrating subject, autonomous and independent, can achieve authenticity. This represents an almost total failure to use narrative to achieve serious social analysis." According to Marachal 2010, the early criticism of autobiographical methods in anthropology was about "...their validity on grounds of being unrepresentative and lacking objectivity." She also points out that evocative and emotional genres of autoethnography have been criticized by mostly analytic proponents for their lack of ethnographic relevance as a result of being too personal." As she writes, they are criticized, "...for being biased, navel-gazing, self-absorbed, or emotionally incontinent, and for hijacking traditional ethnographic purposes and scholarly contribution." The reluctance to accept narrative work as serious extends far beyond the realm of academia. In 1994, Arlene Croce refused to evaluate or even attend Bill T. Jones' still, here performance. She echoed a quantitative stance towards narrative research by explaining, I can't review someone I feel sorry or hopeless about. I'm forced to feel sorry because of the way they present themselves as, dissed blacks, abused women, or disenfranchised homosexuals, as performers, in short, who make victimhood victim art. Croce illustrates what Tony E. Adams, Stacey Hallman Jones, and Carolyn Ellis refer to as illusory boundaries and borders between scholarship and criticism. These borders are seen to hide or take away from the idea that autoethnographic evaluation and criticism present another personal story about the experience of an experience. Or as Craig Gingrich Philbrook wrote, any evaluation of autoethnography less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 is simply another story from a highly situated privileged empowered subject about something he or she experienced prominent philosopher of science karl popper when claiming that falsifiability was a basic criteria of a scientific theory said a theory is falsifiable if there exists at least one non-empty class of homotypic basic statements which are forbidden by Eda's autoethnography makes no claims that can be verified, it is no longer falsifiable. Under this criterion, autoethnography becomes pseudoscience. Topic. Rethinking traditional criteria In her book's tenth chapter, titled, Evaluating and Publishing Autoethnography 
pp. 252–255, Ellis 2004 discusses how to evaluate an autoethnographic project, based on other authors' ideas about evaluating alternative modes of qualitative research. See the special section in Qualitative Inquiry on Assessing Alternative Modes of Qualitative and Ethnographic Research, How Do We Judge? Who Judges? She presents several criteria for good autoethnography, mentioned by Bachner 2000, Clough 2000, Denzen 2000, and Richardson 2000, and indicates how these ideas resonate with each other. First, Ellis mentions Laurel Richardson 2000, pp. 15-16 who described five factors she uses when reviewing personal narrative papers that includes analysis of both evaluative and constructive validity techniques. The criteria are a substantive contribution. Does the piece contribute to our understanding of social life? b aesthetic merit. Does this piece succeed aesthetically? Is the text artistically shaped, satisfyingly complex, and not boring? c reflexivity. How did the author come to write this text? How has the author's subjectivity been both a producer and a product of this text? d impactfulness. Does this affect me emotionally and or intellectually? Does it generate new questions or move me to action? E. Expresses a reality. Does this text embody a fleshed out sense of lived experience? Autoethnographic manuscripts might include dramatic recall, unusual phrasing, and strong metaphors to invite the reader to relive events with the author. These guidelines may provide a framework for directing investigators and reviewers alike. Further, Ellis suggests how Richardson's criteria mesh with criteria mentioned by Bachner, who describes what makes him understand and feel with a story. Bachner, 2000, pp. 264 to 266. He looks for concrete details, similar to Richardson's expression of lived experience, structurally complex narratives, Richardson's aesthetic merit, author's attempt to dig under the superficial to get to vulnerability and honesty, Richardson's reflexivity, a standard of ethical self-consciousness, Richardson's substantive contribution contribution, and a moving story Richardson's impact Ellis, 2004, pp. 253-254. In 2015, Ellis, Adams, and Jones collaborated to bring about a similar list of goals for assessing autoethnography. The list takes encompasses descriptive, prescriptive, practical, and theoretical goals for evaluating autoethnographic work. Make contributions to knowledge. Value the personal and experiential. Demonstrate the power, craft, and responsibilities of stories and storytelling. Take a relationally responsible approach to research practice and representation. Topic. Contributions to knowledge Adams, Ellis, and Jones define the first goal of autoethnography as a conscious effort to extend existing knowledge and research while recognizing that knowledge is both situated and contested. As Adams explains in his critique of his work narrating The Closet, I knew I had to contribute to knowledge about coming out by saying something new about the experience. I also needed a new angle toward coming out. My experience, alone, of coming out was not sufficient to justify a narrative. With the critic's general decree of narrative as narcissism, Adams, Jones, and Ellis use the first goal of assessing autoethnography to explain the importance of striving to combine personal experience and existing theory while remaining mindful of the insider insight that autoethnography offers researchers, participants, and readers, audiences. Ellis' maternal connections can be considered a successful incorporation of the first goal in that she questions the idea of caregiving as a burden, instead of portraying caregiving as a loving and meaning-making relationship. Topic. Value the personal and experiential Adams, Jones, and Ellis define the second goal for assessing autoethnography with four elements which include Featuring the perspective of the self in context and culture, exploring experience as a means of insight about social life, embracing the risks of presenting vulnerable selves in research, and using emotions and bodily experience as means and modes of understanding. This goal fully recognizes and commends the I in academic writing and calls for analysis of the subjective experience. In Jones' Lost and Found essay, she writes, 
I convey the sadness and the joy I feel about my relationships with my adopted child, the child I chose not to adopt, and my grandmother. I focus on the emotions and bodily experiences of both losing and memorializing my grandmother. The careful and deliberate incorporation of auto the I, the self into research is considered one of the most crucial aspects of the autoethnography process. The exploration of the ethics and care of presenting vulnerable selves is addressed at length by Adams in a review of narrative ethics. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Stories and storytelling. Autoethnography showcases stories as the means in which sensemaking and researcher reflexivity create descriptions and critiques of culture. Adams, Jones, and Ellis write, Reflexivity includes both acknowledging and critiquing our place and privilege in society and using the stories we tell to break long-held silences on power, relationships, cultural taboos, and forgotten and or suppressed experiences. A focus is placed a writer's ability to develop writing and representation skills alongside other analytic abilities. Adams switches between first-person and second-person narration and living in The Closet, the time of being closeted as a way to bring readers into my story, inviting them to live my experiences alongside me, feeling how I felt and suggesting how they might, under similar circumstances, act as I did. Similarly, Ellis in Maternal Connections chose to steer away from the inclusion of references to the research literature or theory instead opting to call on sensory details, movements, emotions, dialogue, and scene setting to convey an experience of taking care of a parent. The examples included above are incomplete. Autoethnographers exploring different narrative structures can be seen in Andrew Herman's use of layered accounts, Ellis' use of highboon, and the use of autoethnographic film by Rebecca Long and Anne Harris. Topic. Relationally responsible approach Among the concepts in qualitative research is relational responsibility. Researchers should work to make research relationships as collaborative, committed, and reciprocal as possible while taking care to safeguard identities and privacy of participants. Included under this concept is the accessibility of the work to a variety of readers which allows for the opportunity to engage and improve the lives of ourselves, participants, and readers, audiences. Autoethnographers struggle with relational responsibility as in Adam's critique of his work on coming out and recognizing how others can perceive my ideas as relationally irresponsible concessions to homophobic others and to insidious heteronormative cultural structures. By not being aggressively critical, my work does not do enough to engage and improve the lives of others. In the critique he also questions how relationally irresponsible he was by including several brief conversations in his work without consent and exploited others' experiences for his own benefit. Similar sentiments are echoed throughout Adams, Jones, and Ellis' critiques of their own writing. Topic. From validity to truth As an idea that emerged from the tradition of social constructionism and interpretive paradigm, autoethnography challenges the traditional social scientific methodology that emphasizes the criteria for quality in social research developed in terms of validity. Carolyn Ellis writes, In autoethnographic work, I look at validity in terms of what happens to readers as well as to research participants and researchers. To me, validity means that our work seeks verisimilitude, it evokes in readers a feeling that the experience described is lifelike, believable, and possible. You also can judge validity by whether it helps readers communicate with others different from themselves or offers a way to improve the lives of participants and readers or even your own." Ellis, 2004, p. 124. In this sense, Ellis 2004 emphasizes the narrative truth for autoethnographic writings i believe you should try to construct the story as close to the experience as you can remember it especially in the initial version if you do it will help you work through the meaning and purpose of the story but it's not so important that narratives represent lives accurately only as art arthur bachner argues that narrators believe they are doing so bachner 2002 p 86 
Art believes that we can judge one narrative interpretation of events against another, but we cannot measure a narrative against the events themselves because the meaning of the events comes clear only in their narrative expression. P. Instead, Ellis suggests to judge autoethnographic writings on the usefulness of the story, Bachner, 2001, rather than only on accuracy. Ellis, 2004, p. 126. Art argues that the real questions is what narratives do, what consequences they have, to what uses they can be put. Narrative is the way we remember the past, turn life into language, and disclose to ourselves and others the truth of our experiences. Bachner, 2001. In moving from concern with the inner veridicality to outer pragmatics of evaluating stories, Plummer also looks at uses, functions, and roles of stories, and adds that they need to have rhetorical power enhanced by aesthetic delight. Plummer, 2001, p. 401. Similarly, Laurel Richardson uses the metaphor of a crystal to deconstruct traditional validity Richardson, 1997, p. 92. A crystal has an infinite number of shapes, dimensions and angles. It acts as a prism and changes shape, but still has structure. Another writer, Patty Lather, proposes counter-practices of authority that rupture validity as a regime of truth. Lather, 1993, p.674 and lead to a critical political agenda Olison, 2000, p. 231. She mentions the four subtypes. Ironic validity, concerning the problems of representation, paralogical validity, which honors differences and uncertainties, rhizomatic validity, which seeks out multiplicity, and voluptuous validity, which seeks out ethics through practices of engagement and self-reflexivity Lather, 1993, pp. 685–686. Ellis, 2004, pp. 124–125. Topic. From generalizability to resonance With regard to the term of generalizability, Ellis 2004 points out that autoethnographic research seeks generalizability not just from the respondents but also from the readers. Ellis says, I would argue that a story's generalizability is always being tested, not in the traditional way through random samples of respondents, but by readers as they determine if a story speaks to them about their experience or about the lives of others they know. Readers provide theoretical validation by comparing their lives to ours, by thinking about how our lives are similar and different and the reasons why. Some stories inform readers about unfamiliar people or lives. We can ask, after stake. Does the story have naturalistic generalization? Meaning that it brings felt news from one world to another and provides opportunities for the reader to have vicarious experience of the things told. Stake, 1994. The focus of generalizability moves from respondents to readers. P. This generalizability through the resonance of readers' lives and lived experience. Richardson, 1997, in autoethnographic work, intends to open up rather than close down conversation. Ellis, 2004, p. 22. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Benefits and concerns. Denzin's criterion is whether the work has the possibility to change the world and make it a better place. Denzin, 2000, p. 256. This position fits with Clough, who argues that good autoethnographic writing should motivate cultural criticism. Autoethnographic writing should be closely aligned with theoretical reflection, says Clough, so that it can serve as a vehicle for thinking new sociological subjects and forming new parameters of the social. Clough, 2000, p. 290. Though Richardson and Bachner are less overtly political than Denzin and Clough, they indicate that good personal narratives should contribute to positive social change and move us to action Bachner, 2000, p. 271. In addition to helping the researcher make sense of his or her individual experience, autoethnographies are political in nature as they engage their readers in political issues and often ask us to consider things, or do things differently. Chong, 2008, argues that autoethnography offers a research method friendly to researchers and readers because autoethnographic texts are engaging and enable researchers to gain a cultural understanding of self in relation to others, on which cross cultural coalition can be built between self and others. 
Also, autoethnography as a genre frees us to move beyond traditional methods of writing, promoting narrative and poetic forms, displays of artifacts, photographs, drawings, and live performances Cons. P. 449. Denzin says autoethnography must be literary, present cultural and political issues, and articulate a politics of hope. The literary criteria he mentions are covered in what Richardson advocates, aesthetic value Richardson, 2000, p. 15. Ellis elaborates her idea in autoethnography as good writing that through the plot, dramatic tension, coherence, and verisimilitude, the author shows rather than tells, develops characters and scenes fully, and paints vivid sensory experiences. While advocating autoethnography for its value, some researchers argue that there are also several concerns about autoethnography. Chong 2008 warns autoethnographers of pitfalls that they should avoid in doing autoethnography. 1. Excessive focus on self in isolation from others. 2. Overemphasis on narration rather than analysis and cultural interpretation. 3. Exclusive reliance on personal memory and recalling as a data source. 4. Negligence of ethical standards regarding others in self-narratives. And 5. Inappropriate application of the label autoethnography. P. 54. Also some qualitative researchers have expressed their concerns about the worth and validity of autoethnography. Robert Krizek contributed a chapter titled, Ethnography as the Excavation of Personal Narrative, pp. 141-152 to the Book of Expressions of Ethnography in which he expresses concern about the possibility for autoethnography to devolve into narcissism. Krizek goes on to suggest that autoethnography, no matter how personal, should always connect to some larger element of life. Topic controversy of evaluation There are several critiques about evaluating autoethnographical works grounded in interpretive paradigm. First, some researchers have criticized that within qualitative research there are those that dismiss anything but positivist notions of validity and reliability. See Delorierd and Sambrick, 2011, pp. 593-595 For example, Schwant 1996, p. 60 argues that some social researchers have come to equate being rational in social science with being procedural and criteriological, building on quantitative foundations. Lincoln and Guba 1985, translate quantitative Qualitative indicators into qualitative quality indicators, namely, credibility parallels internal validity, transferability parallels external validity, dependability parallels reliability, and confirmability parallels objectivity and seeks to critically examine whether the researcher has acted in good faith during the course of the research. Smith 1984 and Smith and Heshushis 1986 critique these qualitative translations and warn that the claim of compatibility between qualitative and quantitative criteria cannot be sustained and by making such claims researches are in effect closing down the conversation. Smith 1984, p. 390 points out that what is clear, is that the assumptions of interpretive inquiry are incompatible with the desire for foundational criteria. How we are to work out this problem, one way or another, would seem to merit serious attention. Secondly, some other researchers questions the need for specific criteria itself. Bachner 2000 and Clough 2000 both are concerned that too much emphasis on criteria will move us back to methodological policing and will takes us away from a focus on imagination, ethical issues in autographic work, and creating better ways of living. Bachner, 2000 AP, 269. The autoethnographer internally judges its quality. Evidence is tacit, individualistic, and subjective. See Richardson, 2000, Hallman Jones, 2005, Ellis and Bachner, 2003. Practice based quality is based in the lived research experience itself rather than in its formal evidencing per se. Bachner, 2000, says, self narratives are not so much academic as they are existential, reflecting a desire to grasp or seize the possibilities of meaning, which is what gives life its imaginative and poetic qualities. A poetic social science does not beg the question of how to separate good narrativization from bad, but the good ones help the reader or listener to understand and feel the phenomena under scrutiny. P. 270. Finally, in addition to this anti criteria stance of some researchers, some scholars have suggested that the criteria criteria used to judge autoethnography should not necessarily be the same as traditional criteria used to judge other qualitative research investigations Garrett and Hodkinson, 1999, Holt, 2003, Sparks, 2000. They argue that autoethnography has been received with a significant degree of academic suspicion because it contravenes certain qualitative research traditions. 
The controversy surrounding autoethnography is in part related to the problematic exclusive use of the self to produce research Denzin and Lincoln, 1994. This use of self as the only data source in autoethnography has been questioned see, for example, Denzin and Lincoln, 1994, Sparks, 2000. Accordingly, autoethnographies have been criticized for being too self-indulgent and narcissistic Coffee, 1999. Sparks 2000 suggested that autoethnography is at the boundaries of academic research because such accounts do not sit comfortably with traditional criteria used to judge qualitative inquiries Holt, 2003, p. 19. Holt 2003 associates this problem with this problem as two crucial issues in the fourth moment of qualitative research Denzin and Lincoln 2000 presented, the dual crises of representation and legitimation. The crisis of representation refers to the writing practices i.e., how researchers write and represent the social world. Additionally, verification issues relating to methods and representation are re considered as problematic Marcus and Fisher, 1986. The crisis of legitimation questions traditional criteria used for evaluating and interpreting qualitative research, involving a rethinking of terms such as validity, reliability, and objectivity Holt, 2003, p. 19. Holt 2003 says, much like the autoethnographic texts themselves, the boundaries of research and their maintenance are socially constructed Sparks, 2000. In justifying autoethnography as proper research, it should be noted that ethnographers have acted autobiographically before, but in the past they may not have been aware of doing so, and taken their genre for granted Coffee, 1999. Autoethnographies may leave reviewers in a perilous position. The reviewers were not sure if the account was proper research because of the style of representation, and the verification criteria they wished to judge this research by appeared to be inappropriate. Whereas the use of autoethnographic methods may be increasing, knowledge of how to evaluate and provide feedback to improve such accounts appears to be lagging. As reviewers begin to develop ways in which to judge autoethnography, they must resist the temptation to seek universal foundational criteria lest one form of dogma simply replaces another Sparks, 2002b, p. 223. However, criteria for evaluating personal writing have barely begun to develop Devo, 1997, p. 26 Topic See also Layered account Topic Notes Topic References Adams, T. E., Hallman Jones, S., and Ellis, C. 2015. Autoethnography, Understanding Qualitative Research. New York, Oxford University Press, 1-203. Alan Collinson, J., and Hockey, J. 2001. Runner's Tales, Autoethnography, Injury and Narrative. Auto, Biography X, 1 and 2, 95-106. Bachner, A.P. 2000. Criteria Against Ourselves. Qualitative Inquiry 6, 2, 266-272. Bachner, A.P. 2001. Narrative's Virtues. Qualitative Inquiry 7, 131-157. Bachner, A. 2014. Coming to Narrative, A Personal History of Paradigm Change in the Human Sciences. Walnut Creek, C.A., Left Coast Press. Boyd, D. 2008. Autoethnography as a Tool for Transformative Learning about White Privilege. Journal of Transformative Education, 6 212-225. Chong, Hewen, 2008. Autoethnography as Method. Walnut Creek, C.A., Left Coast Press. Clough, P. 2000. Comments on Setting Criteria for Experimental Writing. Qualitative Inquiry 6 278-291. Clough, P. 1998. Ends of Ethnography. Peter Lang, 2nd edition. Coffee, P. 1999. The Ethnographic Self. London, Sage. Denzin, N. 2000. Aesthetics and Qualitative Inquiry. Qualitative Inquiry 6 256-265. Devoe, M. 1997. Personal Writing in Social Research. In R. Hertz, ed., Reflexivity and Voice, pp. 216-228. London, Sage. Deloriert, C., and Sambrick, S. 2009. Ethical Confessions of the I of Autoethnography, The Student's Dilemma, Qualitative Research in Organizations and Management, an International Journal, 4 27-45. Deloriert, C., and Sambrick, S. 2011. 
Accommodating an autoethnographic PhD, the tale of the thesis, the Viva Voce and the traditional business school, Journal of Contemporary Ethnography, 45, 582-615, Ellis, C., and Bachner, A. 2000. Autoethnography, Personal Narrative, Reflexivity, Researcher as Subject. In, N. Denzen and Y. Lincoln, eds., The Handbook of Qualitative Research, 2nd ed pp. 733-768. Thousand Oaks, C.A. Sage, Ellis, C. 2001. With Mother, With Child, A True Story. Qualitative Inquiry, 7 5, 598-616. Ellis, Carolyn, 2004. The Ethnographic Eye, A Methodological Novel About Autoethnography. Walnut Creek, Altamira Press. Ellis, C. 2009. Revision, Autoethnographic Reflections on Life and Work. Walnut Creek, C.A., Left Coast Press. Ellis, C. and Rewicki, J. 2013. Collaborative Witnessing of Survival During the Holocaust, an Exemplar of Relational Autoethnography. Qualitative Inquiry, 19 366-380. Ellingson, Laura. L. and Ellis, Carolyn, 2008. Autoethnography as Constructionist Project. In J. A. Holstein and J. F. Gubriam, eds., Handbook of Constructionist Research, pp. 445-466. New York, Guilford Press. Glowacki Dudka, M., Treff, M., and Usman, I. 2005. Research for Social Change, Using Autoethnography to Foster Transformative Learning. Adult Learning, 16, 3-4, 30-31. Hayano, D. 1979. Autoethnography, Paradigms, Problems and Prospects. Human Organization, 38 1, 99-104. Herman, A. F. 2012. Criteria Against Ourselves, Embracing the Opportunities of Qualitative Inquiry. International Review of Qualitative Research, 5, 135-152. Herman, A. F. 2014. Ghosts, Vampires, Zombies, and Us, The Undead as Autoethnographic Bridges. International Review of Qualitative Research, 7, 327-341. Herman, A. F., and D. Fate, K. E. D. 2014. The New Ethnography, Goodall, Trujillo, and the Necessity of Storytelling. Storytelling Self-Society, an Interdisciplinary Journal of Storytelling Studies, 10. Hodges, N. 2015. The Chemical Life. Health Communication, 30, 627-634. Hodges, N. 2015. The American Dental Dream. Health Communication, 30, 943-950. Hallman Jones, S. 2005. Autoethnography, Making the Personal Political. In N. K. Denzen and Y. S. Lincoln, eds., Handbook of Qualitative Research, 2nd ed., pp. 763-791. Thousand Oaks, C. A., Sage Publications. Holt, N. L. 2003. Representation, Legitimation, and Autoethnography, an Autoethnographic Writing Story. International Journal of Qualitative Methods, 2 1, 18-28. Humphreys, M. 2005. Getting Personal, Reflexivity and Autoethnographic Vignettes, Qualitative Inquiry, 11, 840-860, Jones, S. H. 2005, M. Othering Loss, Telling Adoption Stories, Telling Performativity. Text and Performance Quarterly, 25, 113-135. Krizek, R. 2003. Ethnography is the Excavation of Personal Narrative. In R. P. Clare, ed., Expressions of Ethnography, Novel Approaches to Qualitative Methods, pp. 141-152. New York, SUNY Press. Lapidat, Judith C. 2009. Writing Our Way into Shared Understanding, Collaborative Autobiographical Writing in the Qualitative Methods Class. Qualitative Inquiry, 15, 955-979. Lunciford, Brett, 2015. Rhetorical Autoethnography, Journal of Contemporary Rhetoric, 5, No. 1 half, 1-20. Marachal, G. 2010. Autoethnography. In A. J. Mills, G. DeRipos and E. Wiebe, eds., Encyclopedia of Case Study Research, Volume 2, pp. 43-45. Thousand Oaks, C. A., Sage Publications. Plummer, K. 2001. The Call of Life Stories in Ethnographic Research. 
In P. Atkinson, A. Coffey, S. Delamont, J. Laughlin, and L. Laughlin, eds. Handbook of Ethnography, pp. 395-406. London, Sage. Rambo, Carroll, 2007. Handing IRB an Unloaded Gun. Qualitative Inquiry 13-353-67 Reed Danahay, Deborah E. 1997. Introduction. In D. Reed Danahay, ed., Auto, Ethnography, Rewriting the Self and the Social, pp. 1-17. Oxford, Berg. Richardson, L. 1997. Fields of Play, Constructing an Academic Life. New Brunswick, N.J., Rutgers University Press. Richardson, L. 2000. Evaluating Ethnography. Qualitative Inquiry, 6 253 255. Richardson, L. 2007. Writing, A Method of Inquiry. In N. K. Denzen and Y. S. Lincoln, eds. Handbook of Qualitative Research, 2nd ed., pp. 923 948. Thousand Oaks, C. A., Sage Publications. Schwant, T. A. 1996. Farewell to Criteriology. Qualitative Inquiry 2, 1, 58 to 72. Smith, J. K. 1984. The Problem of Criteria for Judging Interpretive Inquiry. Educational Evaluation and Policy Practice 6, 4, 379 to 391. Smith, J. K. and L. Heshushis, 1986. Closing Down the Conversation: The End of the Quantitative Qualitative Debate Among Educational Inquirers. Educational Researcher 15 1, 4-12. Sparks, A.C. 2000. Autoethnography and Narratives of Self, Reflections on Criteria in Action. Sociology of Sport Journal, 17, 21-41. Sambrick, S., Stewart, J., and Roberts, C. 2008. Doctoral Supervision, Glimpses from Above, Below and in the Middle, Journal of Further and Higher Education, 32 1, 71-84. Sparks, A. C. 2007. Embodiment, Academics, and the Audit Culture, A Story-Seeking Consideration, Qualitative Research, 7 4, 521-550. Stake, R. E. Case Studies. In N. K. Denzen and Y. S. Lincoln, E. D.'s, Handbook of Qualitative Research, 2nd ed., pp. 236-247. Thousand Oaks, C. A., Sage Publications. Sykes, B. E. 2014. Transformative Autoethnography and Examination of Cultural Identity and Its Implications for Learners. Adult Learning, 25 1, 3-10.